we're going we're to look at actually what John has just presented and um, you know, look at some of the actual facts that's going on in television, right? When we, got, when we spoke and some of the news has come out, TV and Linear has, has actually done quite a good job in the last, the last uh, few months, mm -hmm. yet the money's not flowing. So, Jody, you, you're just in a new position, sitting up high, you're looking at it perhaps from a different perspective. When you were here last, you were CRO. Why, why is that happening? And is that, is that a clear, is that a fair characterization of what's going on in your market? Uh, I think in the New Zealand market, what we're experiencing is whilst we're having single digit declines in linear viewers, we're actually seeing double digit declines in the revenue that comes with linear. So what that tells me is that the revenue is actually falling much faster than the audience they're actually holding up. Now you flip that onto our BVOD platform or our digital business where we're seeing audiences growing at about 15% and our revenue standing firm with that number. So there seems to be this perception of market to invest in digital and what that's meaning is that there's really been an eye that's been taken off the mass reach broadcasters or the linear channels. Why do you think that's happening? Oh look, I think it's a combination of things. I think it's probably, I heard someone earlier speak around the bump that happened during COVID. I think there's, there's been a long term small decline in linear viewers every single year. And then we saw this massive resurgence during COVID. And now there's a bit of a catch up, I think that's happening. You're also seeing obviously the explosion of all sorts of SVOD streamers in the market. I mean, in the New Zealand market, just for clarity, um, we don't have ads within Netflix or within Apple or anything like that. So it's a bit different in our market. But what we're certainly seeing is that just fragmentation even further of where advertisers and marketers are choosing to spend their money. It's really interesting because I think there's a couple of different things happening in the market here locally in Australia. Um, certainly there's a couple of key television players in the market, two to three of them, whose audiences are in total television, that being the combination of broadcast, linear and BVOD, uh, are actually stable to in sort of single digit growth in the last sort of six or seven months. Um, now, some of that, as we talked about earlier today, is probably due to or could be attributed to in some ways the economic climate and perhaps the re-evaluation of a lot of Australians in the value in free content. Um, but I think what is interesting is that you're right, the advertising dollars aren't following. Again, you know, ec the, the economics and the um, state of the current advertising market can be attributed to some of that. But also I think a couple of key um, points that we've heard here today and at the breakfast actually this morning is there's two other things I think at play in the television landscape um, for me that I think as an industry and as the advertisers that support this in industry so beautifully um, that I think we have to get in front of. The first is this notion of claimed behaviour. My 20-year-old doesn't watch TV. My 80-year-old grandmother only wanted YouTube on her phone. You know, my 10-year-old son hasn't watched anything ever. Um, claimed behaviour and actual behaviour that is um, illustrated by data are often two very different things. You know, if I think about my own Instagram feed, the life I claim on Instagram is fundamentally different to the life of a mother with two children, two dogs and a landscaper for a husband. So, you know, there's claimed behaviour all over the place. So I would really caution everybody to fall victim to any claimed behaviour or opinions that are a sample size of one. Um, and I'd also caution all of us who work in a bubble, which is the media, marketing and advertising indus industry, to not recognise that there's lots of people outside this industry that are living a very, very different life to us. Um, the second thing that I wanted to pick up on, um, other than claimed behaviour in terms of why ad dollars aren't coming, uh, is you know, this, um, this notion that, and we've heard it a lot, this notion that television is a brand builder. And it is. It is the best place to build a brand. And it is you know, the best driver of long-term sustainable business growth. But it's not all that it does. And John Evans actually just dropped that into conversation. What television also does is drives performance. And there are countless global and local white papers, research pieces, lots of CMOs in this country actually that you could tap to have a conversation with them about how they have used television to fuel their performance and fundamentally being able to invest less in performance, lower funnel metrics because they're investing more in, in upper metrics. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll come on to that. Let's just have a look at the macro market here. Right, we, we mentioned an article that uh, Paul McIntyre put together saying the amount of money that's going to pour out the TV market. And a lot, by the way, a lot of TV companies say to me globally, it's a poor ad market. It's a growing ad market. It's just all the new money is going to the platforms. So we, 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 have, to, we have to be open and honest about that. Um, if that's the case, if you look at the free-to-air market this year and the amount of players that are in Australia and New Zealand, 
with that, those sums of money is moving out of the market, what will the market look like in two to three years' time? Uh, Joe, well, do you want to start I mean, with maybe your market and then Leon? I was just going to say, I mean, you probably um, have read in the media in the last week or so that, you know, Warner Brothers Discovery have announced in New Zealand that actually they're going to make significant changes and reduce their staff by 75%. So a $20 billion company is struggling to operate in a local market of 5 million people, appreciate the scale, but actually that is a really, really um, fragile market. You know? And so from our perspective, it's ensuring that we're continuing to go out and not just actually talk about our business as a broadcast business, but talk about our business as, as a digital business. The data that we're able to share with advertisers around what the behaviour is on our platform, that's helping them inform not just their video spend, but actually their much broader spend as well. That's where we have to play more into, is actually leveraging the data assets that we have, particularly on our digital platforms, and make sure that we're clearly talking about that as the first conversation that we're having with advertisers and with brands around what they need to do next. In New Zealand, do you see collaboration being, uh, not collaboration, sorry, uh, consolidation amongst the, the broadcasters there? Oh, look, I think there has to be, you know. Um, we're only a market of three big broadcasters, and yeah. we've just seen one acknowledge that actually this market is too challenging for us, you know. So okay. I think there needs, to be, there needs to be more ways that we can collaborate where we don't compete, mm -hmm. and then still compete where our point of differences are. Liana? What about the market here in Oz? Yeah, look, so interestingly, uh, there was a comment by a couple of individuals at the breakfast this morning, which is Chatham House Rules, so they shall remain nameless, um, around the potential for consolidation in this local market. I thought it was in interesting Australia. that he, he said that. Um, oh, I've just revealed it. And, and, I, uh, and I think, um, I'll, I'll move right on from that. I yeah. think, um, you know, consolidation potentially is very real in this country, depending on um, the sustainability of the content stream, which obviously fuels audiences, which then allows for commercial organisations to maximise their revenue. So, you know, content is king, and again, we've heard that a few times here today. If the content pipeline can be sustained in any country, um, and the commercialisation of that content can be sustained in any country, then you have a really healthy model. Uh, but what you're seeing, obviously, globally and also in New Zealand and locally here in Australia, is that that content pipeline is under pressure through global uh, platforms and global, go global um, producers. Uh, and so I think into the future, of course, the industry will look very, very different. But I don't think that's unique to broadcast uh, and, in fact, or to television. Uh, and, in fact, I think consolidation is very real um, across a number of businesses, uh, including the broader media industry, I think. Are you, are you actively globally. talking about consolidation at the moment within Nine? I would imagine every business is talking about consolidation or diversification or all of those sorts of things that that's, if that's you have a, a yes long-term no. sustainable uh. view of your business that, uh, that you would, of course, be looking at strategies around all sorts of different scenarios that could play out. Okay, that's probably a yes then. Um, <laughs> So, okay, look, building on that then, let's talk about collaboration. Now, now I find this topic, I know I, I sort of banned it, I didn't know, a couple of years ago. When I launched the, this event, it was 2016, I think, and uh, Fitz, who's actually over here, Anthony Fitzgerald, um, he, uh, he got up on stage and said, uh, he said, all right, guys, we've got to get our shit together, right? Uh, that's my best Australian accent, by the way, there you have it. Um, do you, has the industry done a good job with collaboration, have, have you got your shit together since that time? Has it changed enough? So uh, I think, and McIntyre actually um, listed a number of the collaborations that have existed across this industry over decades and decades. I think we've had some really gr great wins as an industry and we've come together at times when we've really needed to. Um, again, when, you don't, when, you're, when you're not in direct competition with something in particular. Um, but I, I would say that I think we've absolutely been in inconsistent. And you know, one of the conversations that is alive and well today is around uh, a singular currency for the television industry writ large, um, a single source of me measurement so that media agencies and advertisers can have an apples and apples comparison, which I don't think there is anybody in the room, no matter which camp you may sit in uh, on the measurement debate today, that actually wouldn't, disagree, that wouldn't agree with the fact that if we were doing the right thing by the client, the advertiser and the media agencies that are representing them on their behalf, that a single source of truth and a single source currency would of course be something that is important for us as, as an industry to collaborate on. But I actually think it potentially goes further than that. Um, you know, notwithstanding, we are all fierce competitors and long may that reign. 
Uh, there are technological advancements that we could be collaborating on. There are tools and systems, there are outcomes, there are ROI models, there are all sorts of things beyond that single measurement source that actually could support an advertiser in going into their CEO and their CFO and getting the advertising dollars that are needed to support media generally, marketing writ large, and obviously the television industry. I think Paul McIntyre was, was illustrating where the collaboration is, didn't work. So I'll give you this, right? You can't, you can't dodge this one, Liana. Well, you probably can, actually. You're quite skilled at this, aren't you? Um, if you could give the commercial broadcasters in Australia a mark out of 10 with how well they've uh, collaborated, um, <laughs> one being crap, 10 being we're the best, what would it be? What number would you give? So if I think about the collaboration that has existed with Think Television over the years, yeah. I think that is a really uh, gold standard illustration of how this industry can come together. But we're not a, we're not a 10. We are not a 10 okay. and we have a long way to go is what I would say. Um, you need to be up there? like because So in the UK, they're now saying, um, Jodie, I shared this with you as well, I'll ask your opinion on this. They're saying, compete on content, collaborate on tech. Is it now the time to do that? Yeah, I, I would say I would say yes. yes. You know, but but actually, you can collaborate on content too. You know, there are opportunities, particularly. Well, the US are doing it, right? They're doing it around sports rights. Do you see well, those you, sort yeah, of models coming Yeah, sports rights or windowing market? of different content. You know, the Freddie Wears might have a different window time to what the SVODs might have. So there's definitely opportunity, I think, in content. But I think technology is the way that we should think about collaboration. And to Liana's point earlier, in terms of you know industry-wide, you know measurement or case studies or ROI, that's always been where we've done really well. Yeah. And I think we need to continue to push that because it's really important for the survival of the industry. So a lot of companies, particularly the global streamers, are looking at this as well. They're, they're, they're recognizing that broadcasters can't survive alone just on ads. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the SVODs themselves are realizing, actually, they reach a limitation with just subscription. Mm -hmm. Do you think you guys need both as well within your businesses to, to get back to growth? Uh, yes, I would say absolutely. Diversification of revenue is critical for the future of, of digital broadcasters. Same with you at nine? Well, so Nine's in a fairly unique position in this country because we do already wholly own a subscription video on demand service in Stan. Uh, we have an ad funded VOD uh, product in Nine now and so we do very much, I guess, have the best of both worlds and we're able to share insights and learning and data uh, across the business as a result of, of um, owning those two things. Um, but I don't think it stops there either. You know, I think um, the, future of, the future of television is incredibly bright because what I know about this industry and every single person in this room that operates within it is that we don't stand still and while we should rightfully come under a bit of scrutiny from time to time about collaboration or Once about year, usually whether our, usually at this yeah. time, um, <laughs> about collaboration or whether our um, technology is up to putty when it comes to being a global, uh, you know, a, a global standard of television digital distribution. You know, we should come under scrutiny for those sorts of things, but we reinvent every time uh, and that's why we've been doing this for more than 50 years. Do you think, we talked about this a little bit at the breakfast, but do you think TV's losing that subjective battle? Because you mentioned actually your, your viewership numbers are holding up. Yeah, there may be young people decline. They're still, they're still, you can still get them, right? But is TV bad at selling itself? I would say no. Um, but what I would say is that the global tech companies are very good at doing it. Um, <laughs> good so, so I wouldn't say that we're doing a bad job at it. Um, you've got to think about we are, we are broadcasters are content businesses and for 60 years we have you know, developed news and journalism and produced sport and, and scripted and unscripted drama. So we are content businesses. And, and so what we're finding now is that we're having to migrate those businesses as quickly as we can into the digital world, whereas all the tech companies came in 10 years ago as tech businesses. And so they haven't had to do all of that. So they've come in with these phenomenally um, outcomes-focused products that have really connected with marketers and advertisers. Well, do you think you need to do the same thing? Do you need to influence the marketers directly like they do? We, I would say we have a pretty good open relationship with most of the marketers. The best key for us to get in the door at the moment is we go and talk to marketers about our digital platform and our data offering, and that's what we start with. So we don't start with a presentation that says linear audiences are declining, because like that would be boring. Um, we actually start with the growth in our digital platforms and the first party data that we now have, and how we're able to demonstrate case studies and do some data matching um, examples with them to say that actually, when you look at the automotive category, when 
when you look at the customers that buy electric cars or the customers that actually buy petrol, diesel, bad word I know, those cars, their behaviours are very different. And even though we've got the data for our digital platform, that's helping marketers to understand how they influence the rest of their marketing by on the broadcast channels as well. And we've got real evidence of that. So I would encourage all broadcasters to, to as I'm sure they are, is to talk about their businesses as digital businesses and the digital platforms and the data offering that they have as opposed to what the traditional part of the business is doing. The only other thing that I would probably add to that is I think something that um, broadcast television has struggled with in its history is um, proving the efficacy to, to you know, within reasonable doubt uh, for a court of law, uh, to prove the efficacy of broadcast television uh, in terms of its ability to, to drive performance, to drive long-term sustainable growth, brand, all of those sorts of things. But with now first-party data availability across all of our digital assets, what we know about SVOD platforms, you know, what we're learning from global platforms, um, and the sort of data and analytics we can now bring to the table coupled with things like market mix modelling, things like ROI, things like, you know, working with whether it's Mutinex in the room or Agile who's in the room or Dr Grace Kite of Magic Numbers in the UK or somebody like James Herman in New Zealand. We've got the ability now to prove to the CEO and the CFO that not just digital inventory but broadcast television in inventory can drive both a short and a long-term result. Is, is that where you all sort of you're going to be laser focused on going after what well, a lot of markets are calling it the performance market, working directly with these sort of data sets to prove that TV does a great job short term. Is that is that the sort of the, the go to get after that market at the moment? I think it's both. So, you know, what television has been phenomenal at is building brands and mass reach. And so when we think about the digital ecosystem, it has to be both. It's not one or the other. Um, and we've heard numerous people talk around the importance of both today. So I think that will always be the play that we have to focus on. Okay, so when you look at like, you've seen, you've seen Coca-Cola's announcement, you know, that they're spending a shit ton of their budget into, into social, into digital. Um, there's lots of companies moving out of TV. There's the, um, uh, the newer companies don't quite spend for that amount of money that's been taken out of the industry. So I wonder, where do you get the growth from within the TV? Can you extract more value out of your existing advertisers? Is that one, one path? Or do you see this maybe turning around? Where, where, where's the growth going to come from? The growth is coming from brands who haven't thought they could advertise on TV before. So but they will never spend to the sums that, say, the you know the banks did when they were growing their brands in the past. Well, I think it depends on actually how much money they're spending or what their audience focus is. So we've got specific brands that only advertise in digital because they say, I don't want to buy TV. Well, guess what? They're spending on our digital platforms and they actually are buying TV. It's just all through our digital players. So I actually think there is a, a, a pool of, of small to medium businesses that haven't necessarily spent a lot of money on TV, but I do think they have the capacity to grow because they are spending it. They're just not spending it in our market. Mm -hmm. Diana? Yeah, look, I think there is capacity to grow from... Um, better servicing and proving the efficacy of and working with more creative solutions with the existing clientele that support television. But I do agree, I think there's a huge opportunity to support small medium enterprise um, you know, and extract some of that money out of the digital video market or the social video market uh, that has shifted away because what digital television gives people is access to a price point that is far more accessible um, that can be underpinned by data, whether that's postcode targeted or whatever those things might be. Um, and really enables them to have a very real um, alternate to those solutions. And to your point, while a small medium enterprise might be infinitely smaller than Coca-Cola's marketing budget, you know, there's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And that is where YouTube make the most of their money. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, there is a huge opportunity there to support the growth of those, or the, you know, those small businesses in this country and in New Zealand. Okay, so finally, and both of you get a chance to answer this, uh, Jody. when we put this together, you were saying, hey, you're hearing a lot from the buy side, but you know, what, we need to have a, a platform to say what we need from buyers, clients, agencies and stuff. What do you need from the buy side in order to bring your business back to growth? What I make you happy? <laughs> what I would say as marketers and agencies is you always have a choice where you spend your dollars. And so when you're choosing where to spend your dollars, actually investing in organisations that are creating content, have brand safe environments, are innovating and really investing in that data future. 
I would just ask you to consider that versus spending it with international tech companies that, as you saw last Friday in this market, they have different agendas and they have different objectives. And so I do think that when you have a choice, there's a real opportunity to think about that. And I think as marketers and agencies, that that's something that you should consider. Leona, 10 seconds to it, add to that. It, it's, a, it's a good one, and I won't add to that because I think it was very well said. But there's two things that I would really love from advertisers that I have always wanted from advertisers, um, and that is creativity and decisions that are backed by science. So John Evans has just stood up here before and said that, you know, great creative will fundamentally change the course of your business and your, you know, the efficacy of your marketing. Um, and it's true and there are countless global and local specialists, white papers, all sorts of things that you can source to help support that conversation in the boardroom around why you should invest in proper creativity because it does fuel growth. Your creative is responsible for roughly no less than 50% of the impact of your campaign. That does not mean you spend 50% of your dollars making your ad, um, but it's a really, really important, Im important play. The, sec the selfish reason, um, however, I'm a lover of advertising, but the selfish reason that I would also like you to invest in creativity is because um, your ads directly impact my consumer's experience. And so it's really important that as lovers of advertising and as lovers of marketing, we give audiences a payoff in the ad break that is worth their time and their energy. And that's then obviously going to deliver a result for you as well. And then the second thing was the science. Um, it's not just about measurement. It's not just about a single source currency to, currency to be able to transact television across platforms. It's actually about proving the impact and the ROI of your media mix. And I implore you, if you are not investing in market mix modeling or in understanding the ROI of each of those channels, please do so because I think you'll be very pleasantly surprised by the power of, te of television. Okay, stop making shit ads. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> thank you very much to these two amazing speakers. Um, so we should have a panel all mic'd up and we're very, very lucky to have, we have another person who's traveled all the way from the UK. She's been coming to my events for the last 15 years or so. So please, let's give a massive hand. Where, where are my panelists? Can we just put our hands up and see where that, there you are, okay, great. Let's give a massive round of applause. There. Oh, there she is, it's Joanna Burton, ladies and gentlemen. Massive round of applause for Joanna Burton to come all the way from the UK to experience this event and run this session. Joanna, thank you.